live from the mist and shrouded mountaintop fortress that is X and Y Communications Headquarters. You're listening to the world famous Mountaintop Podcast. And now, here's your host, Scott McKay. Greetings, gentlemen, all across the Fruited Plain, all over the world, wherever you may be listening from. This is Scott McKay, and welcome to the world-famous Mountaintop Podcast. You can find me on the web at www.mountaintoppodcast.com, at Scott McKay on Twitter, Real Scott McKay on Instagram, Scott McKay on YouTube. And I encourage you to join us at the thriving Facebook group, which is the Mountaintop Summit. Today, we're going to do something a little bit different. The last few shows have been on serious topics with serious guests and today we're going to break stride a little bit and go back to our roots which is just being a little bit more fun maybe a bit silly and to do that i found a fantastic charming guest for you i had never met this young lady till this morning when we started talking on the phone and she currently hails from nairobi kenya and if any of you guys know me very well and you visit our website at wingitworldwide.com you know that my heart is pretty much in africa especially in kenya if i could pick up and move tomorrow to kenya i would love to get me a land rover defender and just be that guy well jillian keenan is my guest and as i said she is a journalist and an author who is currently operating from Nairobi, Kenya, which I'm extremely jealous of. And another thing I'm extremely jealous of is she has carved out a niche as a spanking expert, hence the title of this particular episode, which I think is going to become legendary. If what I think we have coming to us and what we're in for here is on the money, I think it's definitely going to be epic, and we definitely deserve it. We deserve a spanking, and here to give it to us is none other than my new friend, Jillian Keenan from Nairobi, Kenya. Welcome, Jillian. Thanks, Scott. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, well, we're glad you're here also, because we haven't had a female guest on this show in a long time, and pretty much the guys prefer female guests around here. It's always a lot more fun. And when we're starting with a topic like this one... I think we're pretty much guaranteed success. So my first question for you has got to be, how in the world did you become a spanking expert? How did you happen upon this happy profession? Well, as it happens, I am a spanking fetishist. I've been absolutely obsessed with spanking my whole life. So I think it is uh, sort of inevitable that um, someone who is so obsessed with spanking would eventually develop some expertise in that subject. How does one become so obsessed with spanking? Well, I think that that question is a bit like asking anyone how they became straight or how they became gay. I would tell you that I was just born this way. Um, I can't explain why. I have my own theories. But just like we don't know the cause of other sexual identities or orientations, I can't say for sure the cause of my fetish. But um, I do tell everyone that my spanking fetish is innate, unchosen, and lifelong. From my very earliest memories, I've been absolutely obsessed with spanking. Okay, so when you're saying you go all the way back, you're talking about being a kid and being bad on purpose so your parents would spank you, or are you talking about something that happened after sexual maturity? Absolutely not, Scott. And um, I'm kind of glad that you brought that up as early as you did, because it's a joke that people make to me a lot. Um, The idea that as someone who has had a sexual orientation, has been oriented towards spanking, Um, as the core of my sexuality for my entire life, uh, a lot of people like to make jokes about the idea that as a child, um, I would intentionally do something to be battered by my parents. Uh, But my response is always this. You like sex, right, Scott? Is the sky blue? Is my wife hot? Yes, I do like sex. Would you have enjoyed having sex with your parents? Heck no. And that is how I feel about practicing or having my sexuality non-consensually inflicted on me by my mother as a child. Uh, my sexual identity was not clear to me as a child. I didn't understand what it meant to have what I call a fetish. Technically, the clinical term for what I have is paraphilia. Um, but fetish is more functional and widely understood, even though technically I don't have a fetish. But I'll use that term just because more people kind of understand it. Um, I didn't understand what it meant to have a, a paraphilia or a fetish. I just knew that I was obsessed with spanking. I thought that something was wrong with me. As I emerged into adulthood and became aware of sort of pop psychology, I certainly became familiar with the theory that something was wrong with me, that I was traumatized by my childhood, something like that. But it was always my sexuality and always the core of my sexual identity. And so, no, of course, uh, no child wants to have their sexual identity uh, non-consensually inflicted on them by a parent. Well, nevertheless, I think it's a fair question because guys who are perhaps novices 
in the whole idea of being a spanking fetishist are going to wonder where did this all start for you and how? And so what you're saying is this is definitely something that is very separate from the idea of spanking as a punishment you would receive from your parents. It's not that you particularly enjoyed that or sought that out. It's just something more about, hey, you know, this idea of spanking, I started enjoying it and I really didn't understand why, but it certainly wasn't something I wanted at the hands of my parents. Am I onto well, something there? I actually don't think the two issues are separate at all because okay. it is the exact same physical act. Um, the biological and physiological processes that happen in my body and in anyone's body during a spanking are the same regardless of whether that spanking is non-consensually inflicted on a child or consensually inflicted on an adult. And my particular manifestation of my spanking fetish is disciplinary. I like to be spanked in disciplinary contexts. I enjoy punishment play, things like that. So I don't think the two acts are different at all. Um, the only difference is, of course, consent. And as you know, consent is the difference between sex and rape. The same is true with spanking. Absolutely. Yeah. So here's what I have to say to this. And mm. I don't know what you're going to say in response to it. This is unscripted, obviously. Mm. I have never met a woman ever who didn't like to be spanked in bed. As long as she felt comfortable and taken care of in that context. Obviously, she didn't want to get beat up. She didn't want to get abused. It had to be consensual, like you said. And, of course, consent is absolutely a given. But when you free them up and make them feel as if they're not going to feel silly or you're not going to somehow slut shame them or shame them in any other way because they like to be spanked, women love to be spanked during sex. Hair pulling, spanking, sometimes women go way beyond that in other fetish-like ways. Like I had a woman say, bite me on the neck like a vampire until I start bleeding, which is where I drew the line. I didn't want to draw blood. And she was like, sure. oh, okay, well, if you're going to be like that, you know, because consent goes both ways. And I just think women love – I think women just sort of generally enjoy this idea of spanking and hair pulling, a little bit of being physically rambunctious or just feeling a bit of pain and indeed perhaps discipline, like you said, as part of erotic fantasy, erotic fetish and sexual satisfaction. Well, I want to stop you right there, Scott, because I think it's important to draw a line between what I'm talking about and what you're describing. Because okay. what you're describing is a sexual kink. That is to say, a preference or a side dish or a fun addition to sex, something that goes along with sex. When I say that I have a spanking fetish, what I mean is not that spanking is something I enjoy in context with sex or in a sexual uh, moment. Uh, that's not what I mean at all. What I mean is that spanking occupies the place in my life that sex occupies in the lives of most people. I have absolutely no interest in sex, which I define as um, genital, anal, and oral sex. It's a pretty boring definition. But I have absolutely no interest in that. I've never been curious about it. I've never craved it. I've had sex, and sex is fine. But um, sometimes I joke that for me, sex is like coffee. I like coffee. I drink coffee sometimes. Coffee's fine. But if I could never have coffee again for the rest of my life, I, I'd switch to tea. I'd, it, that's no problem for me. Spanking occupies that place in my life. Spanking is what I've always been curious about. It's what I fantasize about. It's what I crave. Um, so if sex for me is coffee, in other words, something that's fine, but you know, if I had to live without it, I could. Uh, spanking is oxygen. I couldn't live without it. Um, so at one point in my book, I write that if I had to choose between sex, all kinds of sex, and spanking, It'd be super easy. I'd flush sex like a drug smuggler ditching his stash in an airport bathroom. There's no contest there. Well, I think that flush would be equally costly for most people. So you're <laughs> definitely talking about something that's outside the mainstream zeitgeist for sure. So please describe to us exactly how that works so we can be educated and we can understand. No, it's my relationship with spanking is exactly the same relationship that most people have with sex. I, in my videos that I've been making recently, I talk a lot about people who are sex oriented, that is oriented towards sex, genital, anal, or oral. Um, as a fetishist, I'm not sex oriented. I'm oriented towards an object identity or activity. In my case, it's an activity that is not sex. In my case, that's spanking. So if you think about your relationship with sex, think about the first moment as a child when you saw 
a sexy moment in a TV show and you thought, oh, that's that's interesting. I, I kind of want to keep watching that. Or the first time, maybe as a teenager or, or young man, that you saw a, a beautiful woman that you were attracted to and you thought, oh, wow, I... I kind of have these feelings of what I would like to do with her physically. You were probably thinking about sex. You were probably curious about sex. Um, for me, it's the same. Just replace sex with spanking. Well, my question would be for those of us who aren't coming from that particular orientation, what does sexual activity look like? I mean, do we just get directly to spanking? And I guess even before I ask that, I should ask, is spanking what we think it is? Scott, I actually want to thank you for referring to it as my orientation. Um, because as you know, I do define my fetish as my sexual orientation. Hey, well, you so, started it. You already said so. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm grateful to you for showing me the respect of using my preferred term because I really appreciate it. Not everyone gotcha. does that. So thank sure. you. Um, that's very kind and gentlemanly of you. Um, <laughs> as always. So to answer your question, what does it look like? <laughs> sort of a lot of people are kind of surprised. So that's a question I get pretty often because when I say that I'm a spanking fetishist, a lot of people imagine Fifty Shades of Grey. A few smacks on the backside, followed by three hours of sex with fighting and ropes and handcuffs and all kinds of BDSM stuff. Um, that's not what my life looks like at all. For me, when I say that I'm into spanking, I really just do mean spanking. So um, it is sure what you are imagining. Um, smacks on my backside with a hand, belts paddle, hairbrush, cane sometimes. And it's typically kind of disciplinary in tone. There's some scolding. Um, I write a lot in my book about how important scolding is for headspace. It's kind of like our version of foreplay. And then that's it. And it's absolutely the kind of relationship that is most satisfying and meaningful for me. And there is a community of people who feel exactly the same way. And so that I would push back uh, on you when you said you've never met a woman who isn't into spanking. I'm sure that's true in your experience. And I'm sure that many women enjoy exploring spanking as a kink, something that they can incorporate into their sex lives. Um, but I get hundreds and thousands of emails from male spanking fetishists who are trying to find ways to make their relationship work with sex-oriented partners, sex-oriented women. And they really struggle to make it work because the reality is most women and most people are not into what I'm into. We are a, a small subculture. Well, I can understand that. I mean, if you're yeah. talking about it as a complete sexual orientation, then as far as giving up sex and just doing spanking only – I'm sure that would be off-putting to people who are sexually oriented in different ways, regardless of that sexual orientation. Absolutely. However, I do think that there's sort of a taboo feature to spanking in general that a lot of people who are sexually oriented in different ways aren't comfortable with until they realize that there's a partner out there maybe who will help them realize that. Hey, it's okay if you want to be spanked. I'll help you get spanked. I mean, spanking feels good. Women tend to like how spanking feels, even if they're not – fetishist in the way you're describing it. So people can at least relate, right, to the idea of spanking as sexual pleasure. Absolutely. Um, would you like to know a little bit about the physiology of why spanking feels good to so many people? I was born to learn about the physiology <laughs> of why spanking feels good to so many people. So there is um, an artery called the common iliac artery that runs sort of, um, I'm, I'm not a doctor, uh, obviously. Um, oh, you just play one on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right. Go ahead. Um, well, I do have a video coming up where I briefly play Sigmund Freud. But, well, that's even more um, sexually interesting. Yeah, um, yeah. absolutely. Um, the common iliac artery sort of runs down the pelvic region and directs blood towards the genitals when a woman gets aroused or when a person with a clitoris gets aroused or when a person with a penis gets aroused. Uh, blood rushes down the common iliac artery to the genital region. That's what causes genital blood engorgement. But what a lot of people don't know is that the common iliac artery splits. Half of it directs to the genitals and half of it directs to the buttocks. That's why when a person receives a spanking, the bottom turns red. That's blood rushing to that region. But if blood is rushing down the common iliac artery, it means it's going to both places. Blood is rushing both to the bottom and to the genitals, um, which is the same thing that happens during any other kind of arousal. Blood rushes to your genitals. Um, so that's part of why spanking feels good to so many people. 
Another reason is that studies have found that when a person receives a spanking, the body releases a sex hormone called oxytocin, which can actually um, help limit the pain of a spanking. Um, once you get the oxytocin flowing, spankings don't hurt quite as much. But it is a very nice, good, <laughs> good feeling sex hormone. So uh, that's another reason why so many people enjoy spanking, even if they don't enjoy it in the same fetishistic way that I do. Uh, that's why so many people enjoy it as a kink. And I absolutely agree with you. I think it's a really wonderful and beautiful thing when partners help the people they love explore their sexual uh, interests and curiosities. It's, it's super cool. Yeah. And a lot of guys have a really hard time with this. Once a woman, even, you know, in a very sheepish way, brings up something that she would like to see happen in bed and the guy just stomps all over it like a wild elephant, he's never going to hear that from her again. That's a wasted, blown opportunity to make a woman feel safe and comfortable in her sexuality. And oh man, Jillian, I'm sure you can go off on this, mm. how guys blow the opportunities for themselves by not listening to their partner and not really resonating with this idea of she's trying to tell me something she wants in bed that's going to make things great for us if I would just stop being so stupid about it. And I think a lot of guys really have a hard time with that. And especially vis-a-vis -vis what you just shared with us eloquently, I might add, about how this all relates physiologically to our sexual pleasure. It sounds to me like if you're not into spanking, whether it's a kink or a fetish or whatever, you're really missing out on something that is physiologically designed to enhance sexuality. You're just being closed minded to it all around, whether it's being closed off to the physical part or even to the psychological part of welcoming it if your partner would like to see it happen. Well, I would never want to make anyone feel uh, ashamed of what they are or are not interested in. If people are interested in spanking, that's amazing. If they're not, that's also absolutely OK. Um, there's no right or wrong answers in sexual desire, uh, other than, of course, the infallible standard that is consent. Um, but I do think I agree with you absolutely that it is an especially courageous and um, wonderful thing when people help their partners explore um, the things they might be sexually curious about without making them feel judged or belittled or um, mocked in any way. Help me understand the difference between enjoying it as a kink and having it be your fetish. Because I think if guys encounter women who express desire to be spanked, they should be able to know the difference. I mean, I think Clearly. that there are so few spanking fetishists and we tend to be a pretty tight knit and insular community. <laughs> so um, I think the odds are that if um, one of your listeners is Dating someone who expresses an interest in uh, incorporating spanking play into the sexual dynamic of their relationship, the odds are statistically overwhelming that this is a kink, just something that is part of a broader spectrum of sexual interests and curiosities, which is good. That's that's a great thing, because I think that a kink is easier to to deal with than a fetish. I get so many, Scott, really heartbreaking emails from fetishists who are trying to make relationships with non-fetishists work. Um, and also the reverse, I get emails from non-fetishists who are trying to make relationships with fetishists work. And it's really, really, really hard. Uh, some people say it's impossible, actually. Some, some people are of the opinion that trying to make those kinds of relationships work is as futile as trying to make any other kind of mixed sexual orientation relationship work. Um, so I would say that... Uh, because we are such a small minority, a small subculture, if one of your listeners has a partner who expresses an interest in incorporating spanking in their relationship, uh, it's probably a kink. And that is a that's a good thing <laughs> that's easier to deal with. So I would imagine in that context, it's relatively rare that someone would have the fetish that you have. Someone would have a spanking fetish and not realize it and not have self-identified as such. Or am I being naive? Um. Uh... I think things are getting better. So I grew up, I was, I'm 33. I was born in 1986. So I spent most of my childhood without access to the internet. Um, and I didn't have my own personal computer until I went to college at age 18. Um, but younger people these days are growing up with access to the internet. 
And the internet is such a wonderful place to learn about ourselves. Uh, like I told you, for most of my childhood and adolescence, I thought something was really wrong with me. I thought that I was damaged or traumatized by my childhood. Um, and that was why I was so broken inside. And it was only when I went online that I started to realize that there are other people like me and there's a community and there is nothing wrong with my sexual identity. It's just uh, another point on the really beautiful and diverse human spectrum. But for my generation and the generations that came before, I think it was harder uh, for many people to arrive at that realization because without the Internet, there was no there's no way to realize that it, this is OK, that this is healthy and natural. Um, and that's part of why I wrote the book that I wrote and write the articles that I write and uh, now make videos, because I'm trying to put the information out there for people who, like me, might be worried that they are broken. So I think that more fetishists are not only becoming aware of the fact that they have a fetish, but becoming aware of the fact that that is OK and healthy and natural. Um, so I hope to be part of that sea change. Well, you know, as you talk about the idea of spanking as a fetish, I can't help but wander towards the concept of how people view spanking vis-a-vis -vis sexuality in the mainstream sexual world. And it's with a bit of playfulness, a bit of naughtiness. You know, you've been naughty and I'm going to spank you. And certainly when you refer to it as a kink, and I'm not even sure I'd call it a kink, Jillian, it seems almost mainstream to me <laughs> mm -hmm. that more people like it than not if they would just admit it, you know, mm. naughtiness promotes horniness. When a man and a woman are playing together or flirting together and the implication is someone has been naughty, the quote unquote penalty for that is going to be something sexual if the two of them are attracted to each other. Right. And any man who knows what he's doing in terms of flirting with women knows that a great way to bring out a woman's feminine nature is to bring out the playfulness in her. Mm. So many guys are dead serious and trying to, you know, logic their way into the bedroom with a woman, which of course is the kiss of death, right? <laughs> or the non kiss <laughs> of death, you know. <laughs> and, and it's just so useless. Yet if you relax a little as a guy and you start being playful with a woman and the conversation turns naughty, then that is the context where we start thinking, at least at the mainstream sexual level, we start thinking about spanking as a part of the larger sexual experience in the bedroom. And by sexual experience, I mean physical sexual experience. So obviously in film and media, this is usually how it's represented. The classic mm. example to me is the Monty Python movie, The Holy Grail, where Sir Galahad, who's, you know, chased, finds himself in a castle called Castle Anthrax for all you trivia buffs out there, where mm. he's surrounded by young maidens who are all extremely horny because they haven't seen a man in ages. <laughs> and the penalty for them being so naughty for having done the wrong thing is we all deserve a good spanking. And then the girls all go, woo, they go spank me and me. And of course, Monty Python is silly humor. Mm. And Sir Galahad, of course, gets rescued by, you know, the other brave knights. And he's like, well, you know, I, I think I should I shouldn't have been rescued yet. I think maybe I would have liked to have given them a good spanking. Oh, no, we we certainly rescued you. And he's like, what are you gay? And he's like, no, I'm not, you know, and, and all the girls, you know, once the guy's been rescued, quote unquote, from them, they all look at each other and go, oh, shit, because you know, they didn't get their spanking. And so I have to ask you. Hmm. Is spanking something you're taking more seriously? Obviously, you were laughing along with me because you can see the humor in that particular scenario. But what I'm offering is I think most of us as sexual human beings do see spanking as part of sex play. It is something humorous and almost funny and playful and at the risk of a bad pun cheeky, you know, <laughs> literally and figuratively. So when you say this is your sexual orientation, obviously we don't want to make light of spanking as something that's just merely fun and playful and naughty, or is that okay? I mean, help me no, out it's, here. It's absolutely okay. And some of my very favorite memories are fun and playful and lighthearted. Spanking can be silly. It can be, you can laugh throughout a scene and, and play and have fun. And, and that's beautiful. So I absolutely agree with you 100%. Um, I think the problem arises when people minimize how meaningful spanking really is for fetishists. Um, something that a lot of people, myself included, have gone through 
is the experience of being in a relationship with a sex oriented person and saying, I have, you know, I, I really want to be spanked. Like this is a fantasy I have. Um, this is something that I really need and crave. And a lot of us have the experience of having our partner kind of minimize the seriousness of that. They say things like, oh yeah, everyone's into that. Oh yeah. Like, fine, we can do that. That's just a, that's totally normal. That's totally mainstream. Um, <laughs> kind of like big doofuses like me did at the beginning of this podcast, right? <laughs> well, and it's, it's not, it's, it's not untrue. It is uh -huh. spanking as a kink is mainstream. Um, and it is, it is not a big deal for most people. But the thing is, it, it is a big deal for fetishists. And it's not something we want just a little bit of sometimes to spice things up in the bedroom. It goes a lot deeper than that and incorporates things like, as I said, discipline and scolding. For many people, it includes things like corner time or even mouth soaping. Um, I, I, I joke in one of my videos that bringing up the mouth soaping is a good way to kind of shut people down when they say things like, oh, whatever, everyone's into that, um, because only a certain subsection of us are into things like mouth soaping. Um, that's a good way to scare off tourists, I guess I could say. Tourists. Um, I have to ask a question. Is there yeah. a market for the specialized soap that tastes better? I don't think that that is what uh, people in, in my community want. <laughs> I think so in other words, you're talking about full on Christmas story style mouth soaping. Uh, this is something that many fetishists, myself included, um, respond to in context of our broader uh, experience of our fetish. And like I told you, I, I do get heartbreaking emails from fetishists who are trying to make relationships with non-fetishists work. Um, and if it were, I, I wish it were as simple as, oh, this is mainstream now, everyone's into it, just jump on board. Um, I wish it were as simple as that, because I know many, many people with broken marriages, broken relationships, and broken hearts, um, because of the fact that this isn't something that everyone can just adapt to on a, on a fetishistic level, which is a shame. You know, it's, it's hard. And uh, as I said, there are a lot of broken hearts out there because of it. Okay, so a minute ago, you were saying that your sexual pleasure is derived specifically from hands to buttocks, which is cool. Or belts or paddles or canes or hairbrushes. The tools of the trade, right? <laughs> the tools of the trade, exactly. <laughs> and now we're talking about a psychological element of really enjoying the scolding that comes with it. Absolutely. So are you deriving sexual pleasure from the shame of having done something wrong? I mean, is shame sexy here? Or help me understand how the scolding enhances the sexual pleasure, because the rest of us out here are thinking that has to do with something that doesn't make me feel good at all. I mean, when I feel like I'm being punished for something, that's very much tied to guilt and shame. And I think most of us, at least in the mainstream sexual world, are busy trying to offload sexual shame and guilt rather than pile it on. So where am I missing here? What's the disconnect? You're not missing anything. And at this point, I want to be clear that I'm, I don't speak for all spanking fetishists. Okay. Um, I really can only speak for myself. Um, my experience of my fetish happens to be disciplinary, which is why I respond to sort of disciplinary side dishes like scolding or corner time or mouth soaping, sort of things that have cultural triggers that uh, put me into a disciplinary or punitive headspace. That is my experience of my spanking fetish. However, there are um, spanking fetishists. They're colloquially known within the community as spankos who are non-disciplinary. They, they don't respond to disciplinary type spankings. They respond to the rhythm of spankings or to just the fun of it. They just like the endorphins and the oxytocin, as I mentioned, and the blood flow, um, things like that. So there are disciplinary spanking fetishists and non-disciplinary spanking fetishists, and um, everyone is valid. And even within the sub set, the subset of a subset of disciplinary spanking fetishists. Not everyone is the same. Not everyone enjoys the same disciplinary side dishes that I do. Not everyone plays to the same degrees of severity. And different people respond to different things. There are many spankos for whom shame and humiliation is a strong trigger. It's a strong, um, they love to be ashamed. They love to be humiliated. I am not one of them. Uh, shame is not something I particularly respond to or even feel. I mean, I, I feel shame in my life, but it's not something that I have an erotic response to. So I say if I were to try to like psychoanalyze myself, um, and we have joked about this within the community, I think it would be fair to say that I have a spanking fetish, but also I have something of a discipline fetish. I have responded to uh, at times with friends at spanking parties, um, 
or in my relationship with my current partner responded to things like writing lines as a punishment. I mean, that is obviously not spanking. There's no blood flow or oxytocin uh, when you're writing lines. Um, It's just a disciplinary sort of cultural trigger. So I think it would be fair to say that I have both a spanking fetish and a discipline fetish as many people in the community. But as I said, not all. Talk to me about spanking parties. Is this something that I want to go to as much as I think I want to go to one or am I completely out of my league here? (laughs) So in my experience, sex oriented people always are very curious to come to spanking parties. And then when they come, they get really bored after five or 10 minutes. Uh, It really, (laughs) really is just spanking. Uh, I think a lot of sex oriented people imagine that it's people in sexy outfits um, spanking each other and then having sex. And it's, it's going to degenerate like, into something more interesting to them, right? Yes, exactly. Um, and the reality is people get bored, <laughs> like really bored, because it really is just spanking. So imagine a normal party with like board games and like finger food. And then just imagine slapping sounds in the background. And that is basically what a spanking party is like. And I love these parties. I host them about every other month. So there are big national parties. There are a number of big national parties in the United States, which I link to in the description for um, my video about spanking parties. And then there are also house parties, um, which is where just a few friends come over and, you know, as I said, play board games with slapping sounds in the background. But I'll never forget one of my favorite memories is back when I lived in New York City, I went to one of these smaller spanking parties at a friend's house. And um, one of my good friends in the scene is a spanking fetishist who is married to a sex oriented woman. And she's awesome. She's a good friend of the rest of us. She comes to our parties and she's absolutely part of the community. She's open minded. She's cool. She's awesome. Um, But I'll never forget once I was watching one of my friends, we'll call him Tom. That's not his real name, but for now we'll call him Tom. Um, He was spanking my friend, Bill with a cane. He was caning my friend Bill. And it was a really like heavy scene. Like Bill was taking a lot and he was kind of crying out in pain. And I was riveted, of course. This is the stuff I live for. I, I could have, you know, give me the popcorn. I could have watched that all night long. Um, and I looked over and Bill's wife, who, as I said, comes to these parties so often that they're old news to her now. She was just sitting on the couch reading a book (laughs) while her husband was screaming in pain in the living room because for her, it's, you know, it's just not that interesting at this point. And I think a lot of sex oriented people feel that way. So if if you decided to come to one, um, I suspect you'd be disappointed because it really, really is just spanking. Well, I'd be disappointed if it was another guy spanking, (laughs) first of all. So, of course, the question arises from that when you're talking about spanking fetish as a sexual orientation, then it's naturally going to be bisexual, right? You don't necessarily prefer a man spanking you versus a woman. Yeah, this is very interesting. And um, I hope that if people are curious about this topic, they'll consider um, watching my video about this issue about um, whether spanking is a sexual orientation, because I go into this in more detail. But I do think that for a lot of spanking fetishists, but not all, Um, But for many of us, there is a kind of experience of what seems like bisexuality. Um, Let me put it this way. For a long time, I thought I was bisexual because I don't care if it's a man spanking me or a woman spanking me. What I'm attracted to, what I'm oriented to is the act of spanking. That is what I'm into. So whoever is delivering or the sex or gender of the person delivering that spanking is really irrelevant to me. I care much more about things like, is the person a good scolder? Does the person use trigger words that I like? Uh, Does the person have a play style I enjoy? Um, Sex and gender are irrelevant. But there are people, of course, who are only interested in playing with people of one gender or the other gender. And that's fine, too. Those identities are also, of course, completely valid. I mean, I do think you're onto something because I think so many of us are oriented towards the act of spanking specifically, that it renders sex and gender so irrelevant that at a certain point, it it just seems like we're bisexual. Uh, But I would say that um, we're just fetishists, maybe. Well, that seems rational. Yeah. Here's another question I just thought of. What makes someone sexually attractive to you? Is it the same markers that would make someone else sexually attractive to someone else? Or do you particularly look for someone with a nice ass or what? (laughs) Well, I don't really top. Um, So 
Okay, well, that's another question. We're going to have to talk about that. I mean, who who does the spanking? Who receives the spanking, too? I mean, is it give and take in any kind of relationship, or are there, quote-unquote, tops and bottoms, givers and receivers? There are tops, bottoms, and switches, which is to okay. say tops give spankings, bottoms receive spankings, and switches switch back and forth between the two roles. No pun intended. Yeah, exactly. Switches would be just one of many tools of the trade, right? Ooh, switches are a good one. Yeah. Um I primarily am a bottom, although I tell people that I am a service switch, by which I mean I sometimes like to top my friends as an act of service to them. So if I'm at a party and one of my girlfriends or one of my guy friends, for that matter, says, hey, like I'm feeling really frustrated. I haven't had a chance to bottom you know, in weeks um, and I really need I really want to play I really need a spanking I you know I love my friends I will absolutely say yes please let me do it I want to give you a spanking because um, I want my friends to be satisfied so when I call myself a service switch it's that when I top it is in the service of my friends who I love so dearly service switch that sounds like some serious ace hardware shit yeah (laughs) so mechanical sounding (laughs) all right here's the last question we got to ask it Jillian, do you just go around with a red ass all the time, like literally butt hurt and can't sit down? I mean, how much can one ass take of this? Well, I'm something that uh, I was told when I first got involved in the spanking community and started going to parties and making friends is I told that someday I would stop bruising, which was a prospect that made me incredibly sad because I used to love my bruises. I prized them. Um, I think I was kind of proud of them in the same way that sometimes adolescents are proud of a hickey. Like if they've been making out with a really uh, sexy classmate and they get a hickey, they, they kind of take pride in that. Um, I certainly took pride. I can see that. I took pride in my bruises. I gave little pet names for them. I was always sad when they faded. But the warnings that people gave me were true. If you play enough, eventually your body just sort of stops bruising. So at this point, I'm I'm sad to say I don't really mark anymore. So the short answer to your question is no, I'm, I'm not walking around with uh, <laughs> wounds on me all the time. And as you know, I, I live in Kenya. My current partner and dominant lives in England. But the good news is he has just sold his company and is moving away in just a couple of months. So uh, ask me that question again after he moves and maybe I'll have a better answer for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's a legitimate question because people are thinking, you know, I mean, if I go at it for a few hours, you know, I'm going to have blue balls and my penile muscles are probably going to feel a little wasted and need a break for a while. And one can only imagine after having your butt whacked time and again to sexual satisfaction, mm. you know, it's not like you need a recovery period after an orgasm or anything either. You could just keep on spanking, baby. what is the limit to this it is there is a one friend of mine who uh is very popular in the u.s uh, spanking community who is known for delivering spankings that just last for hours and hours and hours um i think once someone told me he gave a friend a spanking that lasted for something like seven hours and they took a lunch break in the middle (laughs) and then just went back to it. Um, But he is, he is famous for just having an arm that won't quit. So sometimes it it can go on longer than you might imagine. Uh, And that, I guess that's what I'm referring to when I said uh, people who are not fetishists tend to find this boring. Do you really want to watch a seven hour spanking? Uh, I suspect it might not be your uh, favorite activity, <laughs> but uh, I certainly could spend seven hours watching spankings. Well, I guess that brings us to the ultimate question, and that's the practical question. Hmm. For those of us who would like to find out if our female partners are interested in being spanked, how do we broach that subject, even if it is, hey, you know, are you like all these other women? Do you like to be spanked and are just being shy about it? And my follow up question to that would be, is there proper technique to making sure you deliver a particularly sexually effective spanking. How do you explore the idea of spanking, even if you're not a fetishist and you're just into the kink? And then tell me about the mechanics of delivering a good spanking. You know, I think um, lots of people agree with me that one of the most attractive qualities that any person can have is confidence. In many ways, confidence is the greatest aphrodisiac of all. So I think if anyone wants to talk to a partner about exploring some spanking play, 
um, I would say just be confident, be friendly and direct and just ask, have a conversation with your partners, express your interests, tell her or him what you're curious about um, and listen to what your partner is curious about. Also talk about it. Don't be ashamed. Um, be confident, really. Like I know I've said the word confidence like 10 times in two sentences, but I can't stress it enough. Confidence is such a wonderful, attractive and valuable quality. And talking to our partners is the best way to uh, introduce any kind of kink or curiosity into a relationship. Procedurally speaking, mm -hmm. it's also incredibly effective in the real world for most any male-female interaction to follow that continuum of playfulness leading to naughtiness, leading to uttering the magic words, you know, you deserve a spanking. And yes. that could open up the dialogue rather quickly and effectively and fluidly, I might add. Oh, yes. And I'm so glad that you said the word playful again, because it really is so important. I hope most people won't get too distracted by all these serious things I've said about, you know, discipline and scary things like belts and paddles. No, for the vast majority of for people. For what it's worth, I'm distracted, but in the best way possible. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope people won't feel intimidated and think, oh, this has to be some really dramatic, serious, punitive thing. No. The best way, for sure, to introduce um, spanking play into any relationship is, as you said, in a playful way. Um, it can be fun. Laugh about it. Explore. Um, see what works. And then if it turns out you guys really love it and want to go a little deeper and, and try a more disciplinary style scene, that's great. But playfulness and laughing about it and having fun with each other is the best place to start always. And about that spanking, what is the best way to deliver a good spanking? What are the mechanical ah, skills involved? Yes, I I want to become a proselytizer and just walk around Times Square handing out pamphlets telling people how to give better spankings because spanklets. Uh, the spanklets exactly. Because <laughs> the world needs to know. Um I think that a really popular position is what we call OTK. It stands for over the knee. So if you're delivering a spanking, you can take your partner over your knee and spank your partner in that position. Um, it's a really sort of sexy and, and uh, exciting position for a lot of people. Um, Have you ever seen the movie McClintock with John Wayne? Scott, I am a human encyclopedia for every single spanking scene ever. <laughs> well, that would be a particularly seminal one in Hollywood history, I believe. Yes, I have seen it many, many times. So if any of your um, listeners are wanting to know what an OTK spanking looks like, that is certainly a, a place to start. And you get um, two for one in that movie. Yeah. <laughs> delivered by the Duke himself unto none yeah. other than Maureen O'Hara, right? Yeah, it's, it's a good one. Who was known for being a redheaded firecracker in Hollywood. So for her to get the spanking she deserved, that's good stuff. Of course, you know, all the politically correct people are up in arms and think that every reel of that movie should be burned on the stack of all the other books they'd like to ban. But that's a topic for another podcast. But that's the first thing I think of when I think of OTK spanking scenes in movies. Yeah, I, that's certainly the first thing that a lot of people think of. <laughs> yes. Great movie otherwise, by the way. One of John Wayne's underrated movies. Lots of fun. But again, I would just emphasize the things we talked about before, confidence and playfulness. It's hard to go wrong um, if you are confident and playful and keep your ears open, listen to your partner or pay attention to how your partner is responding to the spanking. It's important to keep physical safety in mind. You don't want to be spanking a partner on her lower back or her tailbone. Um, and you also don't want to spank a partner too low down on her thighs. That can be really painful. But talk to your partner about what she is enjoying. If she you know, wants you to spank a little harder or maybe if she wants to try an implement, but again, if you introduce implements into a relationship, it's really smart to make sure that you're using implements responsibly. You can't just pick up any belt or any wooden spoon or any hairbrush and assume that it's going to be safe. Sometimes spoons can have uh, like sharp edges that if um, misused could potentially cut someone. If you're going to play with a belt, which is one of my favorite implements, I absolutely love belts. Um, it's really important to move slowly because a lot of people just don't know how to swing a belt correctly. Belts can wrap um, and hit your partner on the hip or the pelvis in a way that can be really unpleasant and even dangerous. Um, so I would say just, you know, spanking is fun and playful, but there are ways to you know, seriously do damage to someone if you um, 
if you get carried away. So I would encourage people to move slowly, listen to each other, and also that the internet is a really valuable resource. Um, so if people are introducing this kind of play into their relationship, uh, they can definitely learn more about how to play safely online. Well, relative spanking hack such that I am, I would also <laughs> add that that fleshy part of the buttocks near the bottom and off to the side a little bit creates the nicest, most satisfying smack of all. And there's a certain way to kind of relax your hand and kind of rub her butt a little bit before you smack it, kind of like you would address the ball before teeing off. And just mm. like golf, you know, not to make a sloppy golf reference, but <laughs> if the shoe fits, if the hand, if the glove fits, <laughs> are there spanking gloves? Um, so there is one kind of paddle that I've seen that can be, it's an interesting paddle. Um, it kind of slips over the back of your hand with like a strap. So it kind of like, it doesn't have a handle the way a normal paddle does. It sort of just covers the palm of your hand with wood. So that's the closest I can think of to a spanking glove. And those can be popular sometimes because in the spanking community, we have a phrase that is, I asked his palm. <laughs> which is uh, when a spanking goes on so long uh, that blood blisters appear on the top's palm. Um, so paddles like that can be a way to protect the top's uh, hand. Well, to kind of further the golf reference, you could call him Arnold Palmer. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, but anyway, back to golf. Yes. Keeping the important thing central to this conversation. Mm. You kind of address the ball, you know, and there's this sweet spot after you hit it that you know by the sound of your golf swing hitting the golf ball that you just absolutely nailed it. Yeah. That you hit the sweet spot. And I think absolutely there's a sweet spot when whacking someone's butt. Yeah. Yeah, there is. And I also think that some butts are a lot more spankable than others. <laughs> <laughs> I know you kind of shied away from that one, but boy, there's some asses you just want to whack compared to others. Well, I would say that Certainly some butts are more spankable than others, and that is butts that belong to people who have consented. <laughs> right. Yep. Well, hopefully everybody's not all butthurt over this conversation, ourselves included. And on that groaner of a note, I would love to point these guys to your book, which is called, perhaps ironically, Sex with Shakespeare. It's not a book that has spanking in the title. And you're a wonderful writer. You do this for a living. Obviously, your perspective on things is very well educated and, you, you know, you're very well spoken. What can these guys expect when they go to Amazon and grab a copy of Sex with Shakespeare, Jillian? Well, as you noted, the title of the book is fantastically ironic because what they can expect is very, very, very little sex and a whole lot of spanking and, yes, a whole lot of Shakespeare. What does Shakespeare have to do with sex and spanking? So the book is about how Shakespeare helped me come to terms with and accept my lifelong innate and unchosen spanking fetish. Um, as I told you, for a long time throughout my childhood and adolescence, I was really freaked out. I was really scared that something was wrong with me. Um, but I have a lifelong love of Shakespeare and Shakespearean literature, and most of my academic background is in Shakespeare. And the more I explored Shakespeare's characters and Shakespeare's plays, the more I started to see myself reflected in Shakespeare's mirror and started to think that maybe there wasn't something wrong with me after all. I can just imagine you whacking somebody on the butt going, out, damn spot, out, I say. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will say this. In my opinion, there are a couple of kinky characters in Shakespeare, and uh, if people want to find out who. Oh, opinion be darned. I think <laughs> I think that's a fact. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Shakespeare was rather kinky. Yeah. Definitely uh, I mean, his time. I've got no arguments here. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, what you can do is go to www.mountaintoppodcast.com front slash Jillian dash it all. Let's make it spank. <laughs> www.mountaintoppodcast.com front slash spank. It's easier to spell, you know. Yeah, even better. Yeah. S-P-A-N-K, where you can download a copy of Sex with Shakespeare by the wonderful and vivacious and illustrious 
Jillian Keenan. And you can also go to www.mountaintoppodcast.com front slash Amazon and find her book, Sex with Shakespeare, along with books by other guests who have been on our show in the past. Jillian, what a wonderful conversation and had a lot more depth than I expected. And we've had lots of fun with it. You're a wonderful, charming guest. Thank you so much for coming on the show and best wishes and continuing to live and thrive in one of my favorite places in the world, which is Kenya. Yeah, thank you, Scott. I really enjoyed this conversation. Yeah, likewise. And guys, if you haven't been to www.mountaintoppodcast.com yet, I encourage you to do so. This time, I got to tell you, we're half the way through the first month of 2020. If you're going to make a change in your life this year, you're going to have to get started. You know already you deserve better women in your life. You can upscale your lifestyle. You can up-level the amount of adventure you're having in your life. And it all starts with a 25-minute phone call with me. You can sign up for free at www.mountaintoppodcast.com. I'm here for you. I'm exactly the guy you think I'm going to be. I don't play a fictional character on this podcast, so don't be shy about it at all. Absolutely feel free to go to www.mountaintoppodcast.com and get 25 minutes with me for free. You can also check out the YouTube version of this particular episode and others. Download a transcript, which I'm sure is going to fry circuits over at Otter. And get on my daily mailing list where you'll get fluff-free advice on being a better man and getting better women in your life. It's all for you at www.mountaintoppodcast.com. And until I talk to you again on the next episode, this is Scott McKay from X and Y Communications in San Antonio, Texas. Be good out there. The Mountaintop Podcast is produced by X and Y Communications. All rights reserved worldwide. Be sure to visit www.mountaintoppodcast.com for show notes. And while you're there, sign up for the free X and Y Communications newsletter for men. This is Ed Roy Odom speaking for the Mountaintop Podcast.